Okay, open your Bibles to the book of Proverbs. And as Melissa said, I'm going to be talking. This is going to be a little bit of a, of a different sermon than you may be accustomed to. We're going to look at friendship just from the book of Proverbs alone. There's so much in that book about it. Um, and so here's my outline for today. I want to jump right into this. We're going to look at four things about friendship from the book of Proverbs and maybe just a little bit from the New Testament. And, and here's, here's what our outline is. Number one, friendship, how life works best. Point two, less is more, so choose carefully. Three, I get by with a little help from my friends. Turns out the Beatles were right. And fourth, one friend to rule them all. Just a little something for you, Aaron. Put that in there, all right? Um, all of this is going to come from the book of Proverbs. And honestly, a lot of this is to combat myths that we in America have bought into lies about what friendship is, what it's not, what constitutes a real companion. Is it just shared interest? Is it just things that, as a Christian, you look at and you say, that's wonderful, that's great, that's common grace, but that just barely scratches the surface. So we want to look at these things each in their own turn um, and see what they mean. So point number one, how life works best. And this is why I'm titling it this way. Um, you can put that slide up. Yeah, thank you. This is why I'm titling it this way, because we're, we're digging into the book of Proverbs and as most of you know, Proverbs is, maybe you don't know this, did you know the book of Proverbs is a letter that a father wrote to a son? And if you're a girl, that's okay, because you're included in this. This was Solomon writing to David and a, and a few other sons. He had, he had a lot of wives and concubines, so he had a lot of sons that he needed to instruct, okay? And he wrote this letter for them. This is for instruction in righteousness. I, th I think chapter 1, verse 8 says, my, my son... Hear the instructions of, the, of your father and forsake not uh, the law of your mother. So this is a father talking to his children. And would you believe that the greatest theme that is woven all throughout the book of Proverbs, do you know what it is? It's hard to believe that we miss this today. We miss this today, not just as an incredible piece of literature that's ancient that people should look to, but as Christians. I haven't heard a whole lot of sermons on this because I think Christians think, ah, that's so, that's so shallow and I agree, most of friendships are shallow, and that's why we need the book of Proverbs more than we ever have. But this is an instruction manual from a father to a son, and woven throughout is a subject of friendship. Most of us think that Proverbs is just, well, that helps you have that talk about the birds and the bees. Now, the biggest talk that Solomon had with his son was about friendship, what it is, what it's not, how to be a good friend, how to find a good friend, and what the purpose and the goal of, of friendship even is. So... Proverbs is truth in street clothes. It gets down to the nitty-gritty street level, gets in your kitchen, and it tells you this is how life works best. And let me just be totally honest and candid with you. If you do not have the kinds of friendship that Solomon's going to tell us about today, life's not working best for you. I don't care what it looks like on the outside. You're not living up to your God-forged potential, okay? We live in a fallen world and this fallen world will eat you alive without a friend. It will. And so often in the counseling room, what Melissa and I and others encounter is this. This is a very alarming trend, okay? Most of the time when people encounter a tragedy or a crisis or their marriage begins to crumble or fill in the blank, one of the questions we ask them is, okay, is there anybody else in your life that you can talk to about this besides your spouse and besides us? And I got to tell you, and Melissa could confirm this, um, nine times out of ten, the answer is no. I don't have anybody. There is nobody in my life that I can, you know, be strengthened by, be helped by, be encouraged by. I don't have anybody. Solomon says that's a dangerous thing. And honestly, since the book of Proverbs is about wisdom and folly, I'm not trying to, don't want to step on your toes this morning, but you know what Solomon would say to you if your friendships aren't measuring up to what he says in the book of Proverbs? And you're not even trying. <laughs> you know, I know we all fail. We'll get to that. He would say you're a fool. Not only is this foolish, but it's dangerous. And you're going to hit the wall one day, and there's not going to be anybody there to help you. That's what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes. He says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. And check this out. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Wow. Listen to what Hugh Black said. He wrote a book on friendship back in the 1900s. What he said still rings true. He said, the book of Proverbs might almost be called a treatise or like a manual, a handbook 
on friendship. There is no book, even in classic literature, which so exalts the idea of friendship and is so anxious to have it truly valued and carefully kept. How about that? Well, listen, he's not the only one. Listen to some of these um, theological giants that you've probably heard of before. Pull the next slide up. This is what St. Augustine and C.S. Lewis said about friendship. St. Augustine said, In this world, two things are essential, life and friendship. Both should be highly prized, and we must not undervalue them. That's quite a statement coming from the greatest theologian of the first century. Two things in this life are essential, um, or two things in this world, life and friendship. C.S. Lewis said, Friendship is the greatest of worldly goods. Certainly to me, it is the chief happiness of life. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Listen to what Martin Luther said. He said, We ought not to go to prayer when we are depressed, but into the company of good people. Satan is always more menacing when we meet him on our own. Isn't that crazy? Luther is not saying you shouldn't pray or you shouldn't read your Bible, and I'm not saying that. But I'm saying so often we skip over and undervalue uh, the means of grace that God has given us that we, that we forget is one another. And not just one another in a corporate fellowship, but those close connections that we're going to learn about in Proverbs today. Ed Welch said this, and Melissa knows this is not an anti-counseling quote. She would agree with this. Listen to what Ed Welch said. We offer help so often... He says, we offer help so often that we may not even be aware of it. In our era, we consult experts, professionals, and specialists. But when you look at your own history of having been helped, it's likely that you notice very few experts among those who have helped you. Who were your helpers? Were they professional counselors or specialists? Probably not. Most often, they were friends. The regular, everyday people in your life. Friends are the best helpers. And that's why so often um, friendly counsel is better than expert advice because the person who's giving it knows you, understands you, and loves you. Whereas sometimes the counselor, and counseling is great, we believe in it, obviously. We just spent you know, the first part of the service telling you we believe in this counseling ministry. But at the same time, so often what we find in those counseling ministries is that the work that we're doing should be taking place in a, in a friendship that's biblically based. So we are relational beings. The reason friendship is so important is because we're relational beings. And listen, our spiritual health and our mental health can be enhanced by friendships. If you don't have friendships, I will promise you right now, there are areas of growth in your place spiritually and mentally that will not take place. They won't take place. You will either wither or you will flourish, uh, be strengthened or be weakened depending on, in large degree, the company that you keep, the friendships that you're forging. If they're trivial, if they're superficial, if they're shallow, um, then okay. Then that, you know, you're, you're, you're forging friendships that are going to bear fruit out. But if they're based on the person and the work of Christ, and they go deep, and we're going to talk about some of those verses, then you're going to flourish. Because seeking wisdom is a community project, and without a Christian friend, Solomon's contention is you're not going to find the kind of help you need. So whenever you consider the space that Solomon is going to give to friendship, it's really sad, I believe, how neglected it is today, even in the church. Uh, I think so often Christians assume that we know what friends are, what their purpose is, what their goal is, the kind of friendships we should seek, but apparently that's not the case because listen, listen to this statistic. 20% of adults admit to feeling lonely at any time, and the same percentage of those adults say that they have no close friend to discuss a personal problem with. 20%, no close friend to discuss a personal problem with. Mother Teresa said this. I know she's not a theologian I quote very often, but she said this. She worked, as many of you know, her entire life in Calcutta amongst uh, people that were living in destitute and isolation. And she said this. The worst disease was not leprosy and it was not AIDS, but it was loneliness. It was loneliness. And listen, i got to be honest, that hits close to home with me, not because I don't have any friends, I do, but because when I entered ministry, I was in my 20s. And do you know one of the overarching things that spiritual leaders and even pastors kept telling me over and over again? They said, now listen, you're going to be a pastor now, you're going to be in ministry, and there's going to be a lot of responsibility on you. And listen, the one thing you've got to be careful of is you can't really have close friends. You won't be able, you have to keep people at arm's length because you'll just get hurt, you'll get wounded, and it just won't work. You carry a burden and you carry it with, with Christ and the Holy Spirit 
uh, and God the Father, but you're going to carry it alone with them. You can't really have any friends. Oh, my word. You know how devastating that is? Thank God uh, that he had people in my life that overturned that lie. That's a myth. I think that's even satanic. That's depriving yourself and neglecting one of the most powerful means of grace, especially for people in ministry. Uh, And apparently I wasn't the only one that was told this because check this out. Research reveals that 78% of pastors have no close friends. That may not mean as much to you as it does to me, but to me that's 78% of people engaged in pastoral ministry. They're hurting and they're hurting alone. And you say, well, they got their spouse. I know, I understand that. Your spouse should be your best friend. But listen, your spouse should not be your only friend. There's things as a pastor, I need, I need men in my life that can help me, that, that can, you know, the Bible says faithful are the wounds of a friend and deceitful are the kisses of an enemy, and we need that. Husbands need that. Wives need that. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6 says this. It says, many a man proclaims his own steadfast love, but a faithful man who can find? And we know that. It's, fi- it's hard, it's challenging, it's difficult to find a faithful friend. And so, so often what people do is they think, well, listen, it's so elusive. It's like finding a unicorn or a Bigfoot, you know. It just, I'm, I'm giving up. I'm not doing it. So that's the one extreme is I haven't found anybody that's faithful, so I'm giving up. I'm not doing it. The other extreme is this. People that think that friendship is just this happy accident, you know. And this uh, do-nothing approach is it's going to leave you frustrated and disappointed too. The best approach that Solomon gives, gives is in order to find a friend, you must first be a friend, right? It's like a bank account. If you're consistently trying to make withdrawals, but you've never made any deposits, your friendships aren't going to work. Because the Bible holds out friendship is you caring more about other people, putting their interests first before your own. That's how you really find true friends. So point number two, let's get into some of these passages in Proverbs. Point number two on friendship, less is more. Less is more, so choose carefully. And there's two verses up there. One is Proverbs 18.24, and it says this. A man or woman of many companions may come to ruin. And that literally means in Hebrew, broken to pieces. You can be torn to pieces if you just have a bunch of superficial companions. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Did you know that proverb was in the Bible? Man, that's a powerful verse. That is a powerful verse, and it would have shocked people in ancient Near Eastern culture who read it because to the Hebrews, family was everything. And for you to almost contrast them, um, there's a friend you can have that sticks closer to a brother, that would be jaw-dropping. They would say, what are you talking about? And Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, is saying, I know this, trust me. There's a friend that sticks closer than a brother and he's there. And it's not somebody that just meets your needs or flatters you. It's somebody that builds you up and strengthens you and helps you along the journey to becoming more like Christ. So less is more. Spurgeon said this, check this quote out. He said, men in going through the world make many acquaintances, but out of these they have a few special objects of esteem whom they call friends. If you think to have many friends, they are probably misusing the name. Now, do you hear what Spurgeon is saying? He's saying if you have a whole bunch of friends, you're misusing the word friends. Because friends, according to Proverbs, there's only a few. In fact, the, the Puritans used to pray for one, they would call it a bosom friend, like a Jonathan and a David, somebody that was uh, a second self, somebody that was uh, your soulmate, somebody that understood you, that knew you, that loved you, and would care enough to speak hard truth in your life. That's what Spurgeon is saying. Less is more. A man of too many friends or acquaintances comes to run. Now, that either means there's this overwhelming pressure put on them and it breaks them to pieces, or it means... They have no help when they need it, and so they come to pieces. They fall to pieces. It can mean either of those things. I'm not sure. Um, But there's a nugget in this verse in Proverbs 18, 24, and I want to draw it out a little bit because Hebrew is a concrete language, and words are important. And there's two different words for friend in that verse. Let me read it to you. A man of many companions, that word is raya, not haya, but raya, raya. A man who has a whole bunch of rayas may come to ruin, but there is an ahab that sticks closer than a brother. So there's this contrast activity that Solomon is wanting to engage us in. He's saying if you have a whole bunch of companions and acquaintances, and definitely social media would fit into this. I'll say a little bit more about this later. Um, He would say you have a raya, and a raya is not what you need. If you have a whole bunch of rayas, you're going to fall to pieces one day. What you need is an ahab. What you need is an Ahab. 
Um, and that's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. That's somebody that's like glue. That's somebody that gets you, that loves you, that's going to make a covenant with you. It's the same word used of Jonathan and David, okay? It's the same word used of God in Isaiah 41.8 when it says that Abraham was God's friend. It's Ahab. That's what we need. We need an Ahab. But my contention is, in the church today, I see that a lot of people have a, a lot of rayas. <laughs> so we need to exchange our rayas for ahabs. Does that make sense? I know it can get a little confusing, but language is important. A lot of superficial friends will make for a superficial life. You'll never get beneath the surface. You'll never get past how you doing. I'm fine. How are you? Let's just hang out and do whatever. Whatever your activity is that unites you and bonds you together. It'll make for a superficial life, and that'll make for a sad ending. But a few loyal, close, honest friends are going to be priceless. Martin Luther King once said, In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. In other words, the riyaz, riyaz, right? We need a Hobbes. So Jonathan and David, this is a classic story. If you want some examples of what this means, of, of why less is more... This is from uh, 2 Samuel, and you'll remember the story of how Jonathan and David became friends. Um, they became soulmates, and it says that their souls were knit together. Their, their souls were inseparable. They were woven together. Um, and what did it cost? What did it actually cost Jonathan to become David's friend? You guys remember this? Um, David had, a, had Saul, the, the, the terribly pagan king, the first king of Israel. He went south. He turned bad. Um, and his relationship to David was, was fickle. It was up and down. He wanted to kill him one day. The next day he was repenting and crying, you remember? But David's steadfast friend was Jonathan. Listen to this. And this is at a crisis in his life. David was facing a crisis. He was running for his life. He was hiding in the wilderness. And check this out. David saw that, David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horesh. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. Man, don't you love that? He strengthened his hand in God. They didn't just go and play frisbee golf. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? This was a deep, deep friendship and relationship. They were getting underneath, hey, this, these are my fears. Uh, this is the thing that, that, that I'm most uh, fearful of. This is the thing that keeps me up at night. You know, David had nobody, but Jonathan went out. And he said to him, do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. See, that's an Ahab. That's friendship. And notice what Jonathan is telling David. He's just reminding him of what God's word has already said. You remember when the prophet Nathan went and anointed David as king? That was from God. God was saying, David, you're going to sit on the throne of Israel. You're going to rule. For many, many years, Jonathan was just reminding his friend of the Word of God. That's what friendship does. That's what Christian friendship does. It strengthens your affections for Christ. That's the simplest definition that I can give. A true Ahab will strengthen your relationship with Christ. He, he will understand your weaknesses and seek to bolster them and strengthen them. And here's another one, uh, just historically. I don't know if you guys have read Lord of the Rings. It's one of my favorite books of all times. Uh, Peter Jackson made it into a film. So if you've seen the movies or read the books, then you know that the hobbit named Frodo, the only reason that he was able to successfully carry this heavy burden of the ring of power to Mount Doom and eventually destroy it, the key to his success was his hobbit friend, Samwise Gamgee. That was, I mean, do you remember in the movie, there's this really powerful part, you can see it here, if you can see through that, that Frodo, he can't, he's the only one that can carry the ring. It's, he's the only one that can carry the burden. Nobody else can carry it. And his best friend, Samwise Ganji, knows that. And he says, Mr. Frodo, I know I can't carry your ring, but I can carry you. And that's what he did. He picked him up over his shoulder and carried him all the way up to Mount Doom. But there's a really powerful part, there's a really powerful part uh, in that story that I didn't write down, so don't worry about it. No, here it is. Here it is. You can trust us. This is what his hobbit friend said to him. You can trust us to stick to you through thick and thin to the bitter end, and you can trust us to keep any secret of yours closer than you yourself keep it, but you cannot trust us to let you face trouble alone and go off without a word. We are your friends, Frodo. Now you may think, ha ha, that's so shallow, you quote in a hobbit. But listen, there's more truth in that than you see in most novels today. In fact, you know what's most interesting to me? Just being really candid with you today. 
I have to look for images to put up for my slideshows because we're visual learners. I love you that much to spend the time doing the PowerPoints. That's to help all of us. But would you know, I was trying to find a picture of David and Jonathan, and I couldn't find one. Do you know what most of the pictures and the captions were? You know what they say about Jonathan and David's relationship? That it was a homosexual-based relationship. Do you know why? Because the kind of love that we just read about, covenant, radical, unconditional, one-way, uh, your life before my life love, the world can't understand it. They look at something like that and they say, yeah, romance. Yeah, that's homosexuality. They have no clue about, that's what I'm saying, is we're in a crisis today. People even said that about J.R. Tolkien when he wrote that. They said those, those hobbits were gay. No, no, they weren't. Many of them were married, okay? This is just what true friendship is. It's true. It's deep. It's enriching. It's putting the needs of another before yourself. And that's exactly what we see at the cross. The, the, the cross was the most radical, heroic act of friendship that the world has ever seen in the history of the world. And when we start getting close, people can't comprehend it. So they, you know, they, they, they pull the homosexual card. And I'm just telling you that because you'll encounter that. People say, no, that's clearly what that was. No, it wasn't. You know, that was, especially thinking of Jonathan and David and the, and the, the theological culture that they lived in, that's ridiculous to even consider that. Um, but that's interesting. The world can't understand that. So less is more, okay? Less is better. If you have many rayas, that's not a good thing. If you can make friendships really quickly, that's not a good thing. Uh, it's better to go slow. I'm going to look at a verse on that in a minute. And number doesn't count for much in friendship. It's quality that you want. It's a soulmate. It's an ahab. And that brings us to social media. Check this out. This is an unbeliever that said this. Social networking encourages people to have a greater number of much shallower friendships. I know what 15 of my friends had for breakfast, but I don't know whether any of them is struggling with major life issues. If this trend continues, people will have hundreds, hundreds of acquaintances, but very few friends. That's an unbeliever saying that. All he's saying is what Solomon said thousands of years ago. A lot of the people that have uh, emotionally disconnected they're addicted to social media, and they may have thousands of followers, but listen, they don't have deep, meaningful, significant, and Christ-centered relationships, and therefore, this proverb is like a, it's almost like a prophecy being fulfilled in their life. This lady, her name is Sherry Turkle, she gave a TED Talk on the dangers of social media, and it's called Connected But Alone. Again, not a Christian, to my knowledge, but she said, we are lonely but fearful of intimacy. And that's, that's the rub. That's why many of us don't have the kinds of friendships Solomon talks about. She says, digital, digital connections and social media offer the illusion of companionship without the demands of friendship. You know what she means? You can turn off social media when, when it's getting to you, right? When you don't want it any longer or when somebody's arguing with you on social media, you can click it off. But friendship puts demands on you, a true friendship that you can't ignore, you can't slight, and you can't just turn off. That's what true friendship is. And even unbelievers are, are, are starting to see this and encounter this and writing about it. Um, yeah, it's just really interesting, some of the trends. This is what Jonathan, the speaker that's going to be sharing at the B&B event, this is what he said. Friendships in our time are easily disposed of and easily forgotten, typically costing us little and centering around little more than a shared interest. They can evaporate like morning mist. Few of us regularly enjoy a kind of friendship that extends much beyond a narrow range of shared activities and interests. And that's why the next uh, passage in this point is this, Proverbs 12, 26. It says this, and for young people, especially in here today, man, really pay attention to what Solomon is saying here. The righteous should choose his friends carefully for the way of the wicked leads them astray. That word choose again in Hebrew it's a very active word. And the only other time that it's used in the Old Testament is when Moses told 12 men to go and spy out the land, the promised land. You remember this? He said, go into the land of Canaan and spy it out, explore it, investigate it, and bring back a report to me. That's the same word. This is like filled with energy. So in other words, a Christian, when you choose a friend, that word choose, you're investigating. It's not something that you just have. It shouldn't be a happy accident. You are forging a relationship that's, that's going to cultivate your character. I mean, seriously, this is a, it's, it's heavy. It's a big deal. And that's why Solomon is saying, find, find a friend, investigate, research, pray, analyze, because this is important. Uh, this could make or break your character. Um, and that's what he's talking about there. Point 
number three. You know what? Before we get there, let me just say this. Whenever God, in the book of Genesis, He put man in the garden, and He says, keep the garden, tend it, fill the, the earth, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, and then He warned him. He said, there's one tree in the center of the garden that you should not eat from. And the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Right after that command that God gave Adam, do you know what he says? It's not good that man should be alone. I find that really interesting. Right after this warning, look, um, there's this one event that can wreck humanity, plunge your, your uh, offspring into sin, and so beware of it. Don't eat this, this tree. And then right after that, he says, it's not good for man to be alone. And he gave him a friend. Um, we need that. We need that for protection. We need that for accountability and all those other reasons. So this is point number three. I get by with a little help from my friends, okay? This is proverb. There's, there's a few proverbs in here. Uh, we may not be able to cover all of them, but the, the one I want to talk about first is this. Proverb 27, verses 5 and 6. And this is where friendship, this is the reason why Solomon said... Um, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother and a hob. What's the purpose of friendships? Is it just to flatter one another or is it really, really to be used as an instrument, a tool, a means of grace in another Christian's life to help them grow and to strengthen them? Listen to this verse. Better is open rebuke than concealed love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And that's the same word, a hob there. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. This is saying that the one true friend that is going to remain faithful to you during times of affliction or during times of addiction, during a time of besetting sin, is just ensnaring you. Listen, the Bible says that sin so easily ensnares us. We don't need friends that are going to make sin easier to ensnare us, do we? We need friends that are going to help us. They're going to know us. They're going to be a brother in arms, a, a band of brothers and sisters that are going to help us. And... I think one person said it this way, enemies will stab you in the back, but friends will stab you in the front. So I just want to ask you, I know I'm saying a lot this morning, I hope there's not too much information here. I just want to challenge you guys, do you have the kinds of friends in your life that are going to do what this verse says, that are not going to be deceitful, they're not going to flatter you. The Bible says in Proverbs that the friend who flatters is like a person who spreads a net under your feet. That's just a trap. It's a disaster waiting to happen. Do you have friends that love you enough and know you well enough to speak hard truth into your life when you need it? Because we all need it. We all need it. That's a means of grace. If you don't, I really want to challenge you today to examine why is that the case? You know, we'll, we'll look at some practical things at the very end, but Ray Ortland said... <laughs> He said this, can we pull this slide up? He said, our own family background left every one of us a little weird. So we need an honest friend from outside the tightly knit family to round us out. Every one of us needs to go to another person and say, help me see myself. Help me get sharper for Christ. See, we need that. If you're just left to yourself, you're going to just become more like yourself. And that's not what we need. We need to become more Christ-like. And God has built into the fabric of His creation um, a need that can only be met through a friend. And that's rang true. I've seen it in ministry. I mean, I haven't been a pastor for only 15 years, but I've seen it every time. That's why the Bible also says this, Proverbs 17, 17, a brother is born for adversity and a friend loves at all times. Man, if you can find somebody that loves you at all times, good and bad, and they don't have to, that's your friend right there. I guarantee you when you go through a crisis and a tragedy, you will find out who your friends are. I've shared with you my testimony. When I was 21 years old, I got a DWI. This is the most embarrassing and humiliating thing that ever happened to me, and it was also the best thing that ever happened to me. For a lot of reasons, God saved me through that. It's the first time the Holy Spirit blew the lid off my hypocrisy. I had to face who I really was, who I, who I had become, and the people that I had been running with and influencing and being influenced. But you know what else God used that time in my life for? I found out who my real friends were. I had to have a, a device put on my truck I had to breathe in this device to start my truck. And if I used mouthwash or brushed my teeth that morning, my truck wouldn't start. It was humiliating. And you know what? A lot of my buddies, they didn't want to be around that. So I think I spent a week in my room by myself, crying and repenting and reading my Bible, and God saved me during that time. But I found out I had a lot of rayas, a lot of them. I, I, I had 
probably 50 rayas that would hang out on any given moment. But listen, my relationship with them was so superficial and so shallow, it never went beneath the surface. And, you know, when I, when I became a member of a church, then I found the Ahabs that I've been really seeking all my life. And maybe you have too. That's my story. I'm sure many of you have your own. You find out who your true friends are when you go through something like that. Proverb 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so does one man or woman sharpen the countenance of his friend. Now, Solomon's talking about conflict here. Swords sharpening one another, or maybe a whetstone. And there's conflict, there's friction. And that's okay. See, so often, when those times come in a friendship, we bail out, we jump shit. We're thinking, this is not working, this is too hard. No, that's just when it's getting good. That's when you're really going to benefit from that friend in your life. Listen, listen to what uh, Gordon McDonald said. This is such a good quote. I know I got a lot of quotes. I apologize. This is a good one right here. Check this out. There is a certain niceness to a friendship where I can be, as they say, myself. But what I really need are relationships in which I will be encouraged to become better than myself. Myself needs to grow a little each day. I don't want to be the myself I was yesterday. I want to be the myself that is developing each day to be more of a Christ-like person. So let me ask you a question. Do the friends in your life, do they have a hunting license? Do they have a hunting license and do they have your permission to ask you hard questions and to confront you with hard truth when you need to be confronted with it in love? Or are you just playing it close to the vest? Is there boundaries and walls? Is everything just superficial and never really getting below the surface? And in some cases, I'll even say this. We say, you know what? You have permission to ask me questions. Well, listen, if you want to be a good friend and you want to have a good friend... You need to be telling them what kinds of questions to ask you, right? It got really quiet in here because I I get it. As a pastor, listen, being vulnerable is a risk because you will definitely get hurt at times. But listen, you'll find out who your true friends are. In fact, I would say this. Friendship will cost you and the price that it will cost you is honesty. Until you are honest. Until you find somebody that's honest with you and you can be honest with them, you're not going to ever find a true friend. You're just going to find somebody that's going to flatter you and tell you what you want to hear, and you can hang out among the common interests that you have, whether it's sports or movie interest or whatever, but it'll never plunge below the surface, and you'll never be able to be what Solomon is trying to help us become through the Holy Spirit. The wounds of an enemy, excuse me, (laughs) the wounds of a friend are faithful. Listen, that means that criticism is not always bad. And there's a whole lot I could say about this. If you wither If you are so radically insecure that you wither under any kind of criticism, man, you need to just forge yourself more with the gospel, that you are a child of God. And other people's opinion, whether it's right or wrong, uh, that's not going to change your relationship to Christ. You don't have anything to fear. You've got nothing to lose. You've got nothing to hide. You're a child of God. But listen, what you do need is honest feedback from your friends. And that means some criticism is destructive. That's the bad kind. That's the kind you can read it, pray over it, wad it up and throw it away, okay? But there's a lot of criticism that's constructive. It's good. R.C. Sproul used to say this. Don't take criticism uh, personal. Never take it personal, but always take it serious, okay? That means, number one, you should expect it. Expect it. Secondly, you should examine it. And thirdly, you should endure it. Who in here can raise their hand and say, "Some, some godly, friendly criticism changed my life? Changed my life? Shaped my character? Helped me to become self aware? Help me to see that, you know, somebody told me once, they said, Clayton, I got to tell you something, man. I love you, buddy, but man, you talk too much. You just think and talk too much, man. You got to give it a break. You're going to drive people away. Nobody in my life had ever told me that, and that profoundly shaped my life. And you're like, apparently you didn't listen. No, you didn't know me before. Trust me. <laughs> but I, I had some good godly friends in my life that were willing to say that, to say, dude, you got to grow up, man. You got to grow up a little bit you got to be more prudent with your speech. I had people like that sharing that hard truth with me. And you know what? At at first, I was angry. I was peeved about it. I didn't want to hear that. But you know what? When I began to examine that, and I saw the source that it came from. See, that's key. When I saw this person loves me, they have nothing. They stand to gain nothing but a better friend if I listen to their advice. But they stood to lose a lot by sharing it. See, faithful are the wounds of a friend. And Solomon knows a wound hurts. It cuts. But listen, it's like a surgeon. If you don't cut somebody, you're not going to be able to heal them. You can't do the surgery that's required. So listen, the Bible talks so much about this kind of friendship. Don't let it be superficial and just on the surface. 
Let it be true. Let it be enduring. Let it be biblical. The price of real friendship is honesty. There's a, this is funny to me, but it's true history. There was a king who lived in 900 BC, okay? And his name was, he was an Assyrian king named Adab Narai II. And he looked at himself, and here's what he said. Check this out. He said, I am royal. I am lordly. I am mighty. I am honored. I am exalted. I am glorified. I am powerful. I am all powerful. I am brilliant. I am lion brave. I am manly. I am supreme. I am noble. My guess is that that dude didn't have many friends, right? Not only because of his radical arrogance, but because, <laughs> because he didn't have an accurate view of himself. Let's just be honest, okay? Um, somebody else said, I am a lot, and it was God. In Exodus, the first few chapters, chapter 3, you know what he said? I am with you. That's a better I am. That's the way that you use your power. And so many of us, listen guys, we have flaws, we have quirks, we have weirdnesses that we can't see, we don't know about, and we've, we've thrown up walls and we've surrounded ourselves with, with a bunch of rayas that they're not going to go there. And listen, sanctification is, <laughs> there's sanctification that's yet to take place that we need to become more like Christ wants us to be and needs us to be, um, to serve Him well. And until we, we plunge beneath the surface and do what Solomon is calling us to do and invite people into our lives who are going to be an Ahab and are going to faithfully wound us, we're neglecting a, a critical means of grace. I don't talk about this a whole lot. I wanted to, to spend an entire sermon and devote it to this. So here's the last point, okay? Moving along here. One friend to rule them all. That's toss out to the Lord of the Rings fans in here. Listen, there's only one friend who is perfect. I know if we look at everything that Solomon said, it can be crushing because we know we don't have friends like that, probably, that match. And we're not friends like that, right? We're all flawed. We all have weaknesses. We all have blind spots. Um, but there is a friend that the Bible talks about that was perfect. He always wounded faithfully. In fact, it's astonishing. If you want to read really about how to be a good friend, Read some of the same paragraphs that Jesus is praising his friends, the disciples. The very next breath, he's rebuking them. You know, Peter and John, Peter, James, and John were three of his closest friends, and he would call them out. He would call them on the rug. He would call their bluffs. He would correct them, and he would praise them. Um, Jesus was the perfect friend. And aren't you glad that when the Bible says that what's needed of us is perfect righteousness, don't you see that you don't have it on your own? We don't love our neighbor as ourselves, and, and, and we're not a friend to those that God has put in our circle of influence like we should be. But listen, Jesus Christ was a perfect friend to us, and we get that righteousness. We get that. God sees our record, and he sees you are a perfect friend because of Christ. But what made Christ a perfect friend um, was what this verse says. Greater love has no one than this that someone lay down his life for his friends. That's how radical and unconditional and unrelenting, and some people may say reckless, was God's friendship to us and his love to us, is that he gave the ultimate heroic sacrifice to make us his friends. And here's, here's the most radical part of that, is we were his enemies. You realize that? That Christ came from his lofty throne in heaven in an unspeakable act of condescension. He came to his enemies. Uh, he pursued them. We rejected him, and he died on the cross to make us his friends. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that good news? Von Roberts has said this. He said, The recognition that even the best human friendships are limited is certainly not a reason to avoid them, but it's rather a reason to look beyond them to Christ. Look beyond them to Christ. It is only as that our friendships are built on Jesus and all we receive in Him that they will have this secure foundation which will enable them again to flourish. So I hope that some of these Proverbs we're looking at, they have life-shaping power, and I hope that we'll... Take heed to them and, and listen to them. And we'll be right back where we started in Proverbs chapter 20 with the end here. Many a man proclaims his own steadfast love, but a faithful man who can find. Do you hear what Solomon is saying there? Let me read it again. Many a man proclaims his own steadfast love, but a faithful man who can find. You remember Peter in the garden? Right before the garden, rather. Peter was saying, Lord, we will never betray you. I will follow, I'll die for you. And Jesus said, Peter, you'll die for me. You won't even live for me. See, we'll all proclaim our steadfast love, but who can really find a faithful friend? Look what Jesus did in the garden. You know, he stood up for his friends. He laid down his life for his friends. He protected his friends. And he ultimately was sacrificed and slaughtered, slain for his friends. That's true friendship. That's what 
John chapter 13 is talking about. So let me end just with some homework here, okay? I want to give you just some practical things to consider because it would be one thing to just throw all this truth at you and just to leave you to, to find help on your own. So here's some things I want you to think about this week. Number one, practical homework here. I think it will probably do all of us good to pause and consider the role that social media plays in our life. I'm not going to be, I'm not the Holy Spirit, so I'm not telling you to take a social media fast or break or to limit yourself or buy some software or whatever. But I would say this, if you're investing three hours every day and social media relationships are worse than that, if you're arguing on social media all the time about whatever it is, uh, political, cultural, if you're spending most of your time arguing with people that you don't see face-to-face and you're neglecting to invest in face-to-face personal one-on-one relationships, man, you're running away from what Solomon is telling you to do. You're surrounding yourself with with a bunch of rayas when... You can turn off the social media and go find your Ahab and invest in them. That's what God is really calling us to do. Because you're going to find a crisis is going to come and find all of us. And if you've invested more time in social media, those people aren't going to be there for you. They'll be able to send thoughts and prayers your way in a little tweet or a text or whatever. But they're not going to be there for you. Here's the second thing. Um, Just remember that Adam was longing for friendship. You remember that, right? In the garden. It says he, all the animals were prated before Adam, but none of them was found to be a suitable friend or helper to him. But I don't want you to think that his longing for friendship was a flaw. It wasn't. It was a feature. And so is yours. So listen, here's the second thing. This longing you have for a friend, don't suppress that. Don't say, you know what? I'm better on my own. I'm stronger on my own. I don't have time for that. Too many people have hurt me. Listen, take all of that to God in prayer and say, Lord, I really want I really want to have friendships the way that your word says I should. And I need your help. I need to first be the kind of friend that's going to invest and put the needs of others before myself. And I also need to just think realistically about what relationships should look like and what friendships should look like. So all that to say, don't wait for a friend. Find a friend, right? Pray for one. And here's the third thing. What next steps can you take to cultivate deeper friendships? Here's the first thing. Identify a few people and plan some time to get together. I know this sounds so, doesn't this sound just so crazy that we're having to talk about this, but I'm serious. So many people I encounter, they don't, they don't know these things. They don't do these things. If you really want to do what Solomon is calling you to do, identify a few people and plan to get together. You know, go to the park together. Go have coffee together. Whatever it is. Going to see a movie together, that's not going to do it. You're just going to sit beside somebody and not talk, right? Um, here's the second thing. Reach out to a friend you've lost regular contact with. I, will, I could imagine most of the people in this room, there was a true friendship you had and maybe you've neglected it, you haven't invested in it, you've let it fall to the wayside. Reconnect, reinvest. And here's the third thing. For the people that you already are in a relationship with, plunge your conversations below the shallows into the deeper things of life. You know, I can't help but think, have you ever seen the, uh, I don't think it's X Factor, maybe it is, the, the thing that Simon Cowell's on, is that his name? Britain's Got Talent, all of that stuff. Have you, ever, have you ever felt sorry for the people that they're auditioning and they walk onto that show and they audition and Simon asks them, you know, who are you? How old are you? What are your dreams and aspirations? And what do they say? Well, I have this dream to be an amazing singer, you know, to be the next whatever, Mariah Carey, I don't know. And then they do their, <laughs> and then they do their audition and seriously, it sounds like a cat that's dying, right? And you can see the faces of the judges and you can hear their, them snickering and you're thinking, how in the world... Did this person ever be led to believe that they're going to make it as a singer? And listen, when they're done and they get three X's and they're in tears, you know why when you see the support team that they run off stage to and they hug them and they cry with them and they say, you know what, you don't need to listen to them. They don't know what they're talking about. No, it it turns out they do know what they're talking about and you should have never let them get in a position to be auditioning like that if you were a true friend. I know that's funny, but seriously, we need friends like that. Would that have hurt to say, look, bud, you got a lot of talent. Singing's not one of them, you know? Hey, who sings that song? Why don't you let them sing it? They do it better, you know? We all need friendships like that, that just tell us like it is, that tell us like it is. I had a friend the other day I was talking to, uh, and you know, sports was my, that was my life in high school, and it was a little podunk 3A school where I knew everybody in the school, and they knew me, and I played football, and I got to start on the A team. And I thought I was it, man. I'm serious. I thought I was it. I thought everyone came to that football game to watch me, and they knew who I was. They had my number posted on their room in their wall or whatever. 
And I was talking to my friend the other day, and I said, man, were we, were we pretty exceptional athletes? And he said, no, not at all, man. We were just mediocre at best. And I'm like, seriously, man, or for real? He said, dude, I just got to tell you this. Yeah, for real. He said, why do you think neither of us played college? I said, I don't know. I thought maybe the recruiters just never heard about us. And he said, yeah, they didn't because we weren't good enough. I mean, we need, we need friends like that to tell us like it is and to put us in our place in love. So I would pr- my prayer for you would be that you would enrich your friendships with affirmation and encouragement and find in a hob and let the rayas uh, dwindle because the Bible says if you have a bunch of them and not the kinds of friends that David had with Jonathan that you're going to come to ruin. And thank God that our friendship is made perfect in Christ. Amen. He was the true friend that really did lay his life down for us. Well, let's pray.